वेलकम टू द सेकेंड एडिशन ऑफ द जकार्ता फ्यूचर्स फोरम आई एम आरजू रॉय बर्थन जूनियर फेलो एट ऑब्जर्वर रिसर्च फाउंडेशन आई एम रियली एक्साइटेड टू स्टेयर दिस स्टूडियो सेशन फ्यूचर प्रूफिंग वर्क एंड वर्कर्स आई एम जॉइन बाई निवेन वेंचेस्टर हु इज प्रोफेसर ऑफ इकोनॉमिक्स एट ऑकलैंड यूनिवर्सिटी इन न्यूजीलैंड एंड टेरी बी चैपमन हु इज रिसर्च फेलो एट द जॉर्ज वॉशिंगटन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ पब्लिक पॉलिसी यू एस ए uh they're here to answer some daunting questions about a transformative force that has the whole world perplexed uh artificial intelligence and in broader sense how it will affect workers so uh ai isn't just changing um, job descriptions it is restructuring the entire labor market uh forecasts say that 39% of the workers of this uh, 39% of skills workers rely on today will be obsolete or transformed by 2030 uh on the other hand a new 78 million jobs might emerge in tech care and the green sectors on uh, there is the risk of an expertise upheaval as well ai is slicing up entry level tasks shrinking uh, junior hiring and pushing demand uphill towards skilled workers uh, together these trends create a paradox opportunity and displacement and they land hardest in the fast growing economies of the global south where the demographic dividend risks turning into unemployment traps so uh the uh, question that the session uh, aims to answer are the likes of how can we reengineer edu- education and training so that youth can climb a shaky ca- career ladder how can public private deals make investment a skill accelerator and what rules will let talent move as freely as data across the uh, uh, borders of the global south so let's dive in with the first question to niven uh so uh as we saw uh, as as we are seeing in reports around 39% of the average worker skills will be obsolete or transformed by 2030 and 40% of the company's planned sta- uh, staff cuts where ai can replace those tasks so do you think a specific educational policy reform uh, can reliably equip today's youth for the uh, jobs of the future Yes well what we're seeing with the AI is a, a fundamental shift in the the value or the benefits of education and we think about a college degree or a university degree where a student would go for 3 or 4 years they would perhaps earn some specific skills uh, in accounting or finance that could be applied uh, but the true value was that they were learning how to learn learning how to go out process information that made them valuable uh, to companies AI can do that a lot better uh, than most individuals now. So we've seen this downward trend where uh, younger people are deciding not to go to university because the the cost in terms of uh, foregone earnings and also the cost of uh, tuition uh, is not worth the benefit of the end at the end. So we're seeing uh, AI as a key driver of that. So what is needed is a program where students are comfortable using ai and they're able to flexibly adapt to use it in different frameworks and then a lot shorter specific courses and training uh, to use that ai for specific tasks and because it's moving so fast those courses will have to be updated uh, very regularly i don't think the universities are nimble enough to do that on their own so i think there'll need to be a partnership uh, with the private sector for that okay so uh, there is a need to revise the education curriculum and uh, uh, the uh, state and the private sector needs to work on it so i'll just follow up with the second question that uh, uh, if we do it how how do we exactly ensure that the youth can easily transition from education to work well again i think that's what we need the in from the private sector we are a lot of this using ai for specific task that's what companies are interested in right now and they're involved in the training of that and that has to move rapidly so it needs to be ongoing change to keep up with the pace of the technology okay uh, so terry now I'll uh, come to you so uh, uh, we saw that a lot of these new jobs are being uh, projected to be uh, secluded and uh, concentrated in se- specific sectors like uh, the green sectors tech and uh, the care sector so how do we ensure that this job growth which comes from the uh, productivity augmentation uh, aspect of ai uh, is broad based and inclusive okay this is a great question and i think to answer it i have to zoom out a little bit yeah. so bear with me 
So there's a framework that I increasingly use to assess and think about complex policy questions, and that's the planetary boundaries framework. So I will just briefly describe it because I think this will help us get to an answer to your question. So the planetary boundaries framework was developed by a group, a large group of scientists, um, climate, environmental, um, earth scientists who essentially developed a framework that does two things. First, it identifies nine critical Earth systems that need to remain in balance, basically to regulate the planetary system on which we all depend and live in. And the second thing that it does is it defines boundaries for each of those. So the Earth systems, the nine Earth systems are climate, water, ocean acidification, etc. And the boundaries are essentially um, thresholds beyond which changes accelerate the rate of change and the the risk of feedback effects increases significantly. And so essentially what all of this means is that there are crucial boundaries within which we need to remain within to survive on this planet, okay, in simple terms. So already in 2023, we had pr surpassed six of these nine critical thresholds. And I think this relates to AI specifically because, you know, we think of AI as being non-existent, as being immaterial, as not existing, as being in the cloud. But the reality is, is that AI is extremely resource intensive in terms of water, electricity, emissions, um, rare earths. So if we want to ask about the role of AI in work, we have to be very intentional about the regulations and the way that we govern the use of AI. So when we talk about work specifically and the role of AI in work, I think what that means is that we need to, as societies, in a just way, in a democratic process, think about and decide intentionally how we want AI to be adopted. So for example, maybe we don't want AI to take over creative fields. Maybe we do want to deploy and use AI in fields where, such as biomedical research and diagnostics in, in you know, whatever areas where we feel that it's most useful and decide areas where we don't want to deploy it. Because of the resource intensivity of AI, we need to make difficult decisions and we should be using AI in the most useful possible ways. And we should do that in a democrat through a democratic process. And we should not leave those decisions up to the tech bros. We should be making decisions equitably and as societies, both in a locally and globally responsive way. And if you come back to me later, I can talk about maybe how we can actually come to those types of decisions. I think we can follow up with that question directly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think there's another framework that I sometimes use that I think might be helpful for thinking about how you might be able to come up with a process for thinking about regulating AI in meaningful ways where we can deploy and use it in ways that are most useful for society and decide on ways that we don't want to use it. So there's a framework that was created by Deal in the UK, and that framework is called the Four Lenses Framework. And essentially, it, it is combining two different dimensions of the local and the global and the biophysical and the social. So if we use this framework to think about AI and how we want to use it in society, that would mean something like this. Thinking about how we want to ensure that AI meets community needs locally, it meets our social needs and social demands within our local sort of fair share of biophysical limits, water, electricity, etc. And also in a globally responsive way. So. Our use of AI obviously has effects on other places because resources come from multiple geographies, right? So it also has to be globally responsive, and that's especially important for the global north to keep in mind, um, and also meeting social needs of other communities as well. So locally responsive, globally responsive, within those planetary boundaries, within the biophysical limits in which we live on this planet, and in a socially just and socially responsible way, so that we're actually deploying and using AI in the most beneficial possible ways and again we're making decisions as societies and not letting the tech bros decide for us okay thank you um then that's a heavy answer okay <laughs> so uh Nivin, i'll go to you now so um uh, uh, without limiting ourselves to just ai and looking at the future of work uh see uh, 60 percent of employers see broader digital access as the most transformative trend today but yet the cross-border movement of workers remains tangled in red tapes. So uh, what would you say is uh, step one towards a skills passport for the global south that lets, uh, 
let's say nurses in uh, nairobi or coders in india uh, move where demand is the highest and without you know uh, raising concerns about the brain drain at home right well i think the key for this one is mutual recognition of, of degrees so ai can be an enabler here uh, in that we can have a common set of principles that as is spread across a number of degrees and that can be tailored through ai to local conditions so everyone's studying the the, the same uh, the same topics perhaps tailored in a different way but that's the number one thing would be mutual recognition uh, of qualifications uh, and the other one would be visa reform to allow uh, individuals to move uh, across borders okay so uh, uh, terry i'll follow up with a similar question to you what do you think are uh, the current uh, uh would you how do you put it uh, dampers on a uh, movement of talent across countries i think it tends to be political okay and we should be leveraging the movement of people across borders because people have throughout history moved around the world and there are many geographies in the global north and other places where there are actually labor shortages and so allowing people to move like we allow capital and goods to move or used to um is beneficial for society and so i think trying to foster equitable uh rights based migration that allows people to move for work in a dignified and safe way is is important and it's it's critical for economies across the globe okay and finally uh, uh nivin picking up from something terry mentioned that uh, maybe we do not want uh, ai to take away the jobs or uh, impose on the sectors where creativity is needed so uh we are seeing that the fastest growing job clusters are creative thinking and resilience because ai is good at uh, coding and data crunching mm-hmm. so uh, from an economist perspective should this uh, tell the way we measure and reward human capital and especially in the global south yeah well ai is replacing a lot of jobs but it's a complement uh, to critical thinking and creative thought uh, so we still need to train people in those areas to get the most out of ai and those individuals are all of a sudden producing a lot more output so economics would say we should pay those individuals more so we do see some pressure on um some widening inequality driven by ai so there needs to be policies surrounding that making sure that others aren't left behind okay and uh finally a question which i'll ask to you both i'll uh, ask you first so uh do you think uh AI should be left completely to the markets? No, absolutely not. Okay. No, of course not. And that's my tech bro comment is that we need to be intentional about the way that we govern and use and deploy artificial intelligence. We should not allow just the um, market-driven approach. We need to be careful about it because the consequences for the environment, for the climate, socially, ethically are are significant and we need to be careful about how we deploy it and be intentional. Okay. And for the final question to you, similar question but I'll just add a uh but that uh we uh, we do not want to leave it completely to the markets uh, but uh, can we leave it completely to the state or do we need collaboration and then how uh, it certainly needs to be a mixture of the two and like any good or service with an economics there needs to be that framework set out by the state so there needs to be a legal, legal framework there might be some competition policies which is not ai specific we have that now for things like um large utility companies uh, so they can't charge monopoly pricing so we have a lot of tools that we can deploy uh, that we've used in previously and we just tra- treat ai like another good or services uh, and being mindful of just the rapid pace of change that that's happening okay thank you thank you both this has been a great session thank you thank you thank you, thank you.